Thanks for joining us for the Executive Series. Today I'm joined by Don Hansen, who is the Managing Director of Plato Investment Management, and they operate the Plato Income Maximizer Fund. Don, good to talk to you. Good to be here, Tom. Now, why don't we just start off with uh, one of the points that you raised in your April note where you said uh, sometimes winning is not a matter of losing. It sounds like a reasonably straightforward sort of uh, uh, idea, but um, when it comes to markets, it, it does have some depth, that thinking, doesn't it? Well, yeah, I mean, what we're trying to say is that uh, if you avoid the really bad performers, then you're, uh, you, you know, you're already well ahead. Um, and uh, there's always going to be the odd bad performer. And um, at the moment, I mean, a stock we don't like is A&P. You know, clearly there's a lot of negativity for all the financials, but I think more, most recently and at the board level and all sorts of things, I don't need to go into the details, but they're under a lot of uh, pressure. Their share price is off 25%, but if you don't own them, uh, well, you're 25% better off than if you did own them. So by avoiding uh, underperformers, you know, the rest of the portfolio is probably going to do quite well. Indeed. So you're under weight AMP over here. We don't own it in, yeah. the, in, in, in the income strategies, yeah. Yep. So uh, when you look at the structure of your top 10 yielding stocks, um, they're anywhere between 11.9% uh, in the terms of Bank of Queensland to around 66 in the case of James Henderson. Um, do you see anything at the moment now that is changing uh, the way organisations are thinking about their uh, payout policies? Uh, not really, but clearly, I mean, one of the things that, that's at the back of people's minds is probably the ALP policy as to whether that will ever come to fruition, etc. And um, if, if it gets more legs, then I think one of the things that companies may want to do is clean out their franking credits before uh, that sees the light of day. But uh, we can talk about that. I mean, I think there's, there's got to be some question marks about whether it will see the light of day or if it, if it does, it may be quite uh, watered down to what the current proposal is. Okay, well, why don't we stay on that point? So what sort of representations do you think will be made by the financial community to, to the various uh, lobbyists or parties and, and in terms of uh, agitating for not changing well, a number policy. of groups are getting together to represent, I think, concerted front uh, to, to talk to uh, government and opposition and uh, particularly the crossbench senators about, um, I suppose, to some extent, the, the, uh, what I'd say the, some of the flaws or uh, problems with the, with the proposal as it's been put forward because it does seem to be quite discriminatory and, you know, you can have two people in exactly the same situation. Uh, in a self-managed super fund, uh, one one group in a self-managed super fund, one group um, in a um, APRA regulated fund, and you know both have a million dollars. One one couple will get nothing in a sub, in the self-managed super fund in terms of refund of franking credits, and if you're in an APRA regulated fund like Australian Super have come out and said you'll get yeah. full refund of franking credits in their fund, it's like yeah. well, you know how's that fair? In that some super funds are going to be quite you know much worse off than others, so. Um, and that's just a small one. The, you know, another thing is we've seen an example of uh, a couple with a million dollars uh, in their self-managed super fund. They won't get the franking credits under the existing legislation. Um, they've got too many assets to get a part pension. Um, had, the, had they only had a $500,000 in, the, uh, in assets, uh, probably in their own name actually, uh, they'd get a part pension and they get full refund of franking. And uh, a, a uh, uh, planner has worked out that actually you get more income if you had the 500000 than if you had the million dollars. Now how does that work out? You know, you've saved a lot more, saved half a million dollars more and yet you're worse off in terms from an income perspective because of the way the assets test works, that you miss out on part pension but also you lose quite a lot on franking. And because we're talking, you know, for a couple on a million dollars of assets, we're talking five to ten grand in terms of the potential loss of franking credits. And, you know, Think about that from a, a self-funded retiree. That's a that's a hundred two hundred dollars a week, which it's a is lot a of lot money. of money. <clears throat> I mean, that's a huge difference about whether you eat out, whether you uh, you know can can afford uh, you know an entertainment or a, or, a, or a trip away or what have you. Hundred two hundred dollars a week is a lot of money. <clears throat> so, what would you say to someone at this point in the discussion um, who is obviously um, uh, their retirement strategy turns heavily around uh, franking credits? I think the first thing is say don't panic, right? Yep. This is a proposal by the um, opposition. <coughs> um, they need to win government and they need to get it through the Senate. So <coughs> they're ahead in the opinion polls, but not by a lot. Uh, the budget has just come out. It's a fairly friendly budget. That might change those things around. We don't know. We'll have to wait and see. Uh, we'll get a good litmus test with all these by-elections. I mean, the ALP uh, 
could be could be a couple of people down further, uh, you know, given what's happened in, in uh, the High Court yesterday. So don't panic at the moment because there's still a lot of water under the bridge. This, this stuff may never say may never see the light of day, or it may be significantly watered down. Um, yep. In which case, you know, don't react to, to all the, the problems at the moment. Sit back, see what's happening. You've still got a, a, at least a year to uh, analyse what you're going to do. And, and also, I mean, see your financial advisor because um, I've talked to a lot of financial advisors and they can see that, you know, there's a lot of potential holes in this issue and you can yep. restructure your assets and change things around and, um, you know, still get the benefit of franking in certain situations and not have to, not have to change too much. M maybe... You know, others you might have to think about changing your, your superannuation fund, going yeah. from self-managed to a fund that can give you the franking credits. But there's a lot of things you can do. So don't, don't knee-jerk react, don't, don't overreact on this thing. Sit back and think through it and, and seek financial advice. Yeah, it's a good point. So uh, let's just quickly get back to the financials. Uh, the Royal Commission is kicking up a lot of headwinds for, for this group. Indeed uh, it is, so yeah. how, how do you navigate that as a strategy? Well, I mean, look, at, at, at the moment, say, we, we're, uh, we don't like AMP because we think that, they're, uh, that I mean, their business model is all around wealth management and uh, it's hard for them to divest their business because yeah. it's a core business. Yeah. Um, your, your, your bank, uh, Commonwealth Bank, has already started to divest some of the, the problem childs, if you want to think about it. It's also doing restructuring and, 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 and those sorts of things. And so uh, you've got to take each company on, on how it affects that. Um, uh, we're still part way through this issue, but I mean, I, I suppose the broad thing, it's, I, I think it's going to, you know, the, the banks look pretty cheap. Uh, a lot of the financials that are affected look cheap at the moment, but that headwind is going to be there for the next, you know, sort of almost a year. And so I think it's going to be hard for the banks to rally significantly um, in given this headwind. But as we saw last week with, again, yourself, uh, Commonwealth Bank, um, when the APRA finding came out, and uh, yeah, it wasn't a great read, the report, etc., cultural issues, blah, 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 but the actual stock rallied because it wasn't as bad as people. People always worry about the worst. Yep. They price in the worst, and that's, I think, what's happening in the banks as well. They look, to me, very, very cheap from a longer-term perspective. Um, I see this as being a, a short-term distraction. It should be a one-year or, one or two-year distraction, but once uh, it's over and done with, you'll get back, back to the main game. Um, yep. Yes, there are some costs associated with it, uh, ANZ talked about $50 million costs, uh, Commonwealth Bank, because you've had uh, ASIC, APRA and the Royal Commission, you, you will add $200 million for costs, but $200 million is a lot of money, yeah. but in a bank that makes $10 billion and after tax, that's not a lot of money. That's, yeah. you know, one and a, less than one and a half percent of earnings in that, in that number. So uh, I think we shouldn't be too, don't overreact again to the negativity. If anything, I see that this uh, the Royal Commission could be a buying opportunity to get into some financials cheap now. But you've got to ensure that you see that they've got a, a good ongoing business model. It doesn't mean buy everything, but uh, I think there'll be chances to buy banks uh, at a, a pretty good long-term entry level. Okay, and so how does that viewpoint influence the, the strategy that you're applying to PLA at the moment? Yeah, well, I mean, our strategy uh, in PLA is quite an active strategy, so we actively rotate between stocks to capture income. Yeah. And well, let's face it, the banks are now trading on some pretty good yields. Um, yes, price has gone down, but that means that the, the dividend yields, and most stocks have maintained their same dividend, yeah. or even you know, a small increase in Combank's case in uh, August, uh, August last year. Um, that they're on good yields, so we still see, and given that, that we think their valuations pretty much have priced all the negativity, we're quite happy to move in and, in and out of those banks to grab the uh, grab the income. At the moment, we're uh, say we're a bit shy on, on, on the likes of AMP, but uh, you know we think that there is good long-term value in those stocks, and there's certainly some good income. Yeah, and obviously, if there's going to be a change in dividend policy on the part of the, the banks, that's telegraphed well ahead of time. Is there any uh, any risk that you see in that picture as far as that conversation changing? Well, look, there could be risk, but I mean, think about this: if, if um, you know, I'll take another bank, but NAB is, is looking to divest its wealth management business. Uh, the negative is it's going to um, lose the earnings from its wealth management business. Um, it seems to me, though, that you know, in our analysis, the return on equity of the wealth management business hasn't been as much as the core business. So, yep. divesting something with a low return on equity is actually probably a good good in the longer run, but also yep. you're going to sell it and get some money. So you yep. can use that money to, say, buy back shares or, um, you know, maybe even do a tax effective buyback. So it's not that, you know, it's not necessarily negative that they might divest a business because they're going to make money from that and they could 
return capital the investors or what yeah. have you, and, and yeah, deploy it into an area where they can get a high return on equity, such as core banking. So Don, outside of the financials universe, what are you relying on for income in the PL8 fund? Yeah. Well, the beauty of our strategy is that we're very active and we can move to where dividends are. And it's just happened that whilst, uh, well, particularly we've seen one of the big income stocks, Telstra, cut its dividends significantly, so you're getting a lot more less income out of Telstra this year, um, there's been some great opportunities in the likes of Rio and BHP have increased their dividends substantially. Um, and so we were able to go in and, and uh, buy those stocks for the income. We might only be overweight for them for a few months because we are very active, but we can capture that income when there's good income out of those sorts of areas. So not having the shackles of being this long-term buy and hold where, yep. you, you know, if you are long-term buy and hold, you're probably going to be always overweight the banks and Telstra and had a very tough time in the last 12 months. We are able to move the portfolio to where we see dividends, where we see good opportunities um, and not just be overweight the highest yielding stocks in the market, which... Um, you know, haven't done all that well in the last uh, 12 months. And obviously represents some risk as well in doing that. Yeah, I mean, we, we are not taking big sector risks by being, you know, say, significantly overweight um, financials or, or the bond sensitive areas, which have also come under a bit of pressure with US uh, rising interest rates in the US. Um, you know, resources tend to do quite well in a rising interest rate environment as well. Commodity prices uh, for our core commodities have held up pretty strongly, and so we're seeing some very good dividends from that sector. Don, it's always good talking to you. Thanks for your time. Yep, all right. Thank you, Tom. And thanks for joining us.